Hello lovely patrons, welcome back to another Patreon exclusive video. This one is a little late and I do apologize. Life went a little bit crazy with the event scene opening up here and me suddenly being catapulted back into work. And in fact, a five week campaign around the country with very little notice and no ability to be prepared so that I could put videos out whilst I was away. So I do apologize that this is delayed. However, I am slowly getting my old routine back and getting on top of things. So you will get two videos this month, one to make up for last month, this one, and of course your October content as well. Do not worry. I haven't forgotten about you. I just literally haven't been at home uh, and able to do work. But this is the promised uh, jewelry video where I talk about the kind of nitty gritty of collecting vintage pieces and give you the goss on where I find out my information about how to test pieces, how to tell if pieces are the real deal, etc. So without further ado, let's get into it. What have you got? If you saw my recent YouTube video all about costume jewelry in the 20th century and how it came about and how jewelry went from being something that was a marker of wealth and status to something that was a fashion accessory that was to go with your clothing that changed with the seasons that changed with what was in fashion at the time etc then you'll know that I said my patreon exclusive video would be about how to actually collect vintage jewelry and how to keep an eye out for things that are worth money. One of the main collectible items of jewelry that you will hear about all the time in the vintage community is Bakelite. So I thought I would start there. Now in the video, I already explained what Bakelite is and what kind of pieces were made out of Bakelite, but I wanted to let you know how to test Bakelite because I find a lot of people on the internet these days put Bakelite question mark next to things. And so you can pick up items that aren't particularly expensive because people aren't sure whether or not they should be selling it at Bakelite prices. But obviously you wanna know if it's a real Bakelite piece. So how do you go about testing it? So you can test Bakelite chemically with a product called Simachrome. It is a household polish that is widely available. And what you do is just on a piece of the jewelry where it's not going to show really obviously if it goes wrong, is you rub a little bit of the polish on a rag and if the rag has sort of a whitish or pale yellow color or smear on it then the piece is probably Bakelite. The other way to test Bakelite is with heat and obviously the easiest way to do this is with like a hairdryer or run the piece under some hot water just with a tap and if it has a smell like formaldehyde then you're dealing with a Bakelite piece so it's not really that complicated and is something that you can do at home you don't need sort of fancy stuff in order to do it like you can go for the Simicrone method or you can literally just use your kettle or your hairdryer or hot water. Bakelite in general is very collectible but some of the most collectible pieces are the translucent pieces so translucent green in a translucent sort of apple juice color and one of the most collectible is translucent red. If you see these pieces popping up it is worth investing in them because not only are you investing in Bakelite which is collectible but you're also snagging rare Bakelite. This is not just stuff that I just know off the top of my head. I have some fabulous websites that I like to go to for information and the one for Bakelite is called Love to Know. So it's jewelry.lovetoknow.com and then if you type Bakelite jewelry into the search bar you'll find all sorts of articles with information about Bakelite, rare Bakelite, uh, how to go about collecting it, etc. And I found that to be a really, really good resource. It was very, very in-depth and they obviously know what they're talking about. So I would recommend that site for Bakelite. Beyond Bakelite, there's many other types of costume jewelry that are highly collectible, including big brand names like Chaparelli, Dior. You might have heard of like Miriam Haskell. She's quite a popular one as well. But beyond that, there are ones that you would have heard of more in that time. So they're not names that are still big now, and they include people like Hattie Carnegie, obviously Coco Chanel, we still hear about that now, but just forgot to mention it. Coro, which was also Coro Craft, and Vendome. So that's a tricky one because you might not associate them as all being the same company, but in fact they are. Jonas Eisenberg. Hobe, but most particularly Hobe's son, William Hobe. You've also got Philip for Trafari. So uh, Trafari jewelry in and of itself was really big in the era, but Philip for Trafari is quite a collectible designer for them as well. So doing your research and finding out 
what in particular are people after because it also changes you know what was collectible as vintage when I was in my teens is different to what is collectible as vintage now because as things get older or things get rarer or things are more likely to, deter to deteriorate over time, then good versions of that, well-kept versions of those pieces are going to go up and up and up in value. So it is worth kind of keeping up with the current information on these things. And there is great blogs out there for that as well. One of the really good ones that has a really comprehensive sort of um, catalog of information about costume jewelry is modernvintagestyle.co.uk. Something that uh, is really, really helpful is to know how to date the jewelry because obviously with modern costume jewelry, they often emulate the style and a lot of the styles of costume jewelry has not changed. And so you can buy stuff that is made now that looks 1950s. So how is it that you go about actually determining whether the piece is a true vintage piece and specifically what decade in the 20th century is the piece from. I sort of ventured into this with brooches. So for example, the brooch I'm wearing now, which I will take off and show you, has a very specific type of pin to it. it has this little clasp with a little knobbly bit that you pull up and then you hook the pin into it and you push the clasp closed. Now this type of closure or clasp is called the trombone clasp and it was typical from the late 1800s through the 1950s. Perhaps you will see it after that, jewelers who have a penchant for it and they enjoy making pieces that way. But this piece, because of that, I would say is probably from the 1950s. It doesn't really look like an earlier piece, maybe the 40s, but I doubt it just based on its condition and also the style would, would be likely to be 1950s. Once you kind of know some of this stuff or you at least have, you know, a little link on your phone that takes you straight to the websites where you can get this information, I find shopping at antique stores and vintage stores way more fun because then you start to look for particular things. You're like, oh, I want to start trying to find some brooches that have this class or whatever. You know, you might not buy all of them, but even just if you don't have any budget and you go hunting through these stores to be able to be like, oh, that's from, you know, the 1800s or that's from the mid 20th century or that's this particular jewelry maker or or whatever it's really exciting and fun it just makes like the whole treasure hunting process really really cool so i use a particular website for this as well because i'm you know my brain is not just filled with this information so i tend to just keep it in a link on my phone so i can jump on there and be like i wonder you know this doesn't look like a modern clasp so i wonder when this clasp is from or there is like earring fixtures or you know stamps on jewelry it's really really helpful and that is myclassicjewelry.com backslash blog black backslash vintage dash jewelry dash hardware and it has a ton of picture examples and information and it gives you all the dates and everything it's really really helpful there are many blogs on this if you just put in how to date jewelry by the hardware or by the fixings it will come up with a bunch of other blogs as well it sort of starts to be the same thing with knowing which kind of designers are really collectible, like knowing that early Dior and Coco Chanel are really collectible pieces from like the 1920s and 30s because it was like the birth of costume jewelry. And so the pieces are really unique and special and Coco Chanel was herself designing them and they went with her different ranges. So when she bought out a line, her jewelry went with that line. So people become really obsessed with collecting that stuff and it is very, very expensive. But you can pick up things like Miriam Haskell brooches, which will continue to gain value, but, or increase in value, but there are pieces you can find at the moment that are quite affordable. And there is quite a lot of unsigned stuff on the internet. So if you do your research and get to know what a Miriam Haskell brooch or piece of jewelry, you know, she did earrings and other things as well, looks like, then when you spot a brooch online that kind of looks like it, you can ask if there's not photos already of, you know, the back of it and stuff, you can ask for pictures of things that you know are going to be markers of an unsigned Miriam Haskell and then pick one up for a bargain price and hang on to it and keep it in good condition to be able to sell later. Or you can just be sporting a Miriam Haskell unsigned piece, which is very cool. So yeah, I think the process of getting to know this stuff is really, really fascinating. And the big thing with jewelry is just, you know, asking those questions in Google is like how to date vintage jewelry, how to recognize unsigned jewelry by X, how to recognize unsigned jewelry by Schiaparelli, how to recognize unsigned jewelry by, you know, William Hobe, etc. Uh, you'll find plenty of blogs come up with that. So some key terminology for you guys, knowing to use like hardware or fixings as your terms for 
um, recognizing jewelry. So the hardware and the fixings are like how you literally close the piece of jewelry onto your body. Those are really, really key factors for figuring out when the piece was made. And it can be kind of tricky because sometimes the jewelry fixtures might have been invented in like the 1800s or even earlier and were continued to be used continue to be used into the mid 20th century but then it's like the style of the piece plus the fixing that allows you to put it in a certain era so you know looking at old jewelry ads and things to see what the women were wearing with their clothing because the clothing obviously gives away the decade quite well like oh okay i see you know a repetitive image of this type of brooch or these types of earrings for the 30s or the 40s or the 50s that's the kind of stuff i'm going to look out for also i just feel like people overlook jewelry quite often and so if you're wanting to kind of take your outfits to the next level and figure out what women wore in those eras really paying attention to those old adverts and even old movies and things and seeing them from that new light of looking at them for their jewelry is a really good way of starting to learn what came from what decade so yes, so this is actually quite a short and sweet video. I don't have my jewelry collection available to show you at the moment. Unfortunately, it is in storage and because of my living situation, I live in a shepherd's hut and I can't insure a shepherd's hut because it's a fire risk. So I don't want to bring anything valuable into the hut in case anything happens to it or I get robbed or something because none of it will be covered. So it's all in storage at the moment. So eventually I think I might make another video showing my costume jewelry off to you guys. I'll probably put that one on YouTube, but I thought it might be fun to have this conversation with you about how how to go about collecting uh, vintage costume jewelry and those are some really good resources that I use and this is something that I'm just starting to get into as well I used to just collect pieces because I liked them whereas now I'm getting interested in dating pieces and also collecting them for a specific purpose to make sure that I have certain special pieces or that I'm getting a bargain you know I like to know I'm getting a bargain so if you manage to pick up a really cheap piece and you're like oh my gosh I just got you know a Dior piece or I just got a an unsigned Hobe or whatever that's really cool you know sometimes even if you're not 100% sure it's just being able to say to people like I think this is this and it's really exciting and share it with the community and stuff or share it in the chat group that we have on discord like it's just fun it's just like a nice thing to connect with other people as well and give you like a purpose when you do your your vintage shopping or your thrifting at antique stores so yes I hope it was interesting. I hope it was helpful. All the links are going to be down below so you guys can use the same resources that I do. And let me know if you like these types of videos and I can do some more research and share some more information on it. If costume jewelry or accessories or shoes or whatever you like is taking your interest and you want some more information on it, do let me know. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video and in the Discord chat. Bye.